Okay, welcome back to Social Studies. We are on page 281. We are starting our fifth unit, unit number five. Independence and new government. All men are created equal. Um, that's from the Declaration of Independence. Why does it matter? I'm going to tell you right now, this is a super big deal. It's a super big deal, okay? Um, I did not realize how big of a deal this is until I went back to school to get my license renewed. And one of the classes I took was, um, was a social studies class. Social studies is cool because it doesn't just look at the history. It looks at, um, like money and finances and all the jazz, right? And it looks at it across the board. And the reason this is a super big deal is because other places that are now countries that started out as colonies like the United States are socioeconomically poor. That means they sell off their natural resources like trees or gold or whatever for pennies on the dollar because they can't afford to live without selling it. But then they buy really expensive stuff back from, that's a finished product, product back from other countries. We, our country, sells wood. We sell wood to China or some other place. You know what they do in some places? They pick up the whole trees, they put it on a ship, they take it just beyond our water area, <clears throat> excuse me, they cut it up, they bring it back into port, and then they sell it back to us for a lot more money. So that's the kind of stuff that they do to other countries, except the other countries don't have enough infrastructure, they don't have enough stuff, enough ways to make money. We have, we have a lot of different ways we can make money, right? Um, we make movies, we sell movies, we have musicians, we have jobs for schools and all kinds of things. Um, we have a company in our city that just sold the majority of their jobs down to Mexico. They exported jobs down to Mexico because it's cheaper to make it in Mexico than it is to make it here, right? The only problem is, is that we've lost a bunch of jobs in our community, right? And um, now they can make the same things for way cheaper in Mexico because they don't have to pay the workers as much. So it's a big deal that we decided to fight for independence when we did and how we did. That's a big deal, okay? A young Virginian named Thomas Jefferson wrote these words on one of our country's most important documents. On July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence was approved. It explained to the world why American colonies were breaking away from Great Britain. That's why we celebrate July 4th as our Independence Day, because that was the day they voted to separate from Great Britain. Otherwise, we would be driving on the other side of the road, because if you go to England, they drive on the left side instead of the right side, right? They um, speak British English, and we will run into British spelling when we are reading Anne of Green Gables. They spelled um, color C-O-L-O-U-R instead of C-O-L-O-R like we spell it. So we will run, run into different spellings of the same word because there's an American spelling and then there's an English or Great Britain spelling. O-U-R, right? Yeah. 
And we run into it a little bit with um, Indian in the cupboard, right? A little bit of different spellings. Um, but you will, we will. Um, the sign of the beaver was, I believe, an American author, but Indian in the cupboard is clearly not an American author, at least originally. So they're spelled a bit different. Um. In 1776, the war for independence had already begun. After six, six long years, the British were finally defeated. So we declared independence July 4, 1776, but it took six years. 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82. So sometime in uh, 1782... The British were finally defeated. The newly independent colonies had become states. So we originally started out as the 13 colonies. So if you look at the stripes on the flag, the stripes have, there are 13 stripes for the 13 original colonies or the 13 original states. So the colonies became states and they needed to create their own government. Now, remember, we've talked about own government a little bit before. We talked about it when the pilgrims got off course, right? And they ended up somewhere else. And then they set up a government system before they got off the ship. We talked a little bit about it with the Puritans. So we've done own governing types of systems. But now this is for realsies. You would have to look it up. I'm not, I'm not 100% positive. I do know, obviously, the stars represent each current state. So in the original thing, they had so many, I think, they might have had 13 stars originally also. And then as we've added states, we've now gotten to 50 states. Um, we have some territories too, but we have 50 states. So that's why we have that many states, or stars. But I'm not sure... Um, and there's meaning behind the colors also. So if you look at other flags, other countries' flags, or even our state flags have different meanings behind the flags that represent us. It's kind of cool. All right. Um, in 1789, the Constitution of the United States was accepted. And we did Constitution Day, remember? Back in, I think, September, October was Constitution Day. Um. Two years later, the Bill of Rights was added. Together, they set down the responsibilities of the government and the rights of people. So the Bill of Rights are our right to bear arms, um, our right for free speech. Um, those are rights that were guaranteed under the Bill of Rights. They started out with 10. We've added um, some amendments after that. Um, one of the amendments is women have the right to vote. That's one of the amendments. Um, together they set down the responsibilities of the government and the rights of the people. A new government began working to build the young United States. So we're going to turn the page. Now, notice the snow. Notice how cold it is. Notice the cannons. Notice the soldiers marching. Um, it says... Tough times. I lay here two nights and had not a morsel of anything to eat. So this person is there for two nights. He's not had anything to eat. So that means today is Wednesday. You just had lunch. So that means you won't have any dinner tonight. No breakfast tomorrow, no lunch tomorrow, no supper or dinner tomorrow night, no breakfast the next day, no lunch the next day. So you've been there for two days and you've not had anything to eat. So that means you will have no food from now until Friday after lunch. Not even a crumb. Not even a crumb. Not a piece of chocolate for Miss Richardson. Woe is me. No egg treats. Woe are you. 
nothing to eat for two days, you would be very, very what? Hungry. Hungry. Now, are you going to get to eat dinner tonight? Yes. But, but I want to make sure you guys understand. That means no lunch, no breakfast, no snack, no lunch, no supper, no breakfast, no snack, no lunch. Supper, dinner. Some people call lunch dinner. It just depends on where you are at and what do you call it. I lay here two nights and had not a morsel of anything to eat. Keep that sad sentence in mind as you look over Valley Forge, where General George Washington and some 12,000 soldiers shivered through the winter of 1777 and 1778. Today, history buffs come to march across these fields. So these are history buffs. Even when the place is blanketed with snow, it's hard to picture that terrible winter. But imagine you're a soldier whose shoes were worn out weeks ago. So you've walked in your shoes long enough that there is no rubber or no whatever on the bottom of your shoes. Did they have duct tape to duct tape it together? No. So what they would do is they'd wrap it with a rag or that type of thing and they would tie them together okay um an officer whose men grow thinner each day because a hungry person gets super skinny right um a commander-in-chief which would be george washington in this case sitting at a desk in a stranger's house wondering how your ragtag army can survive let alone battle the mighty british Imagine getting a letter from that young soldier who hadn't eaten. How would you reply? If you wrote a letter to your mom or your dad right now and said, Mom, Dad, I have not had any food for two days. How would they feel? So what would they say to you? Would they say, please stay, keep fighting the war? Would they say, come Home, I'll feed you, right? That's probably what your moms would say. Come home, I'll feed you. My dad, my mom would say, deal with it. All right, not, not for two days, not for two days. Breaking ties with Great Britain. Thinking about history and geography, the history of Chapter 11 begins in New York City in 1735. John Peter Zinger, a print, printer... Uh, was one of the first colonists to establish freedom of the press. So freedom of the press in 1735, that was a really long time ago. For the next 50 years, colonists in North America moved toward independence from Great Britain. The timeline shows some of the events that led to the birth of the United States of America. We call it birth because right now the United States is part of Great Britain. It's a great Great Britain colony, right? The birth of a nation means that's where it begins. It begins to be itself. 1735, New York City, the trial of printer John Peter Zenger establishes freedom of the press. So he was put on trial for something. 1770, Boston, protest by Crispus Atticus and other colonists lead to the Boston Massacre. Massacre means there was a mass killing. Okay? Boston Massacre means there's a mass killing. 1773, Boston Harbor. Colonists dressed up as the Mohawk, which is a Native American tribe, take part in the Boston Tea Party. I went to Boston when I was a Girl Scout, when I was in seventh grade. And one of the things that we got to do was we got to go on a ship and pretend to be Native Americans and throw tea off into the water. It was pretty cool. So I'll, t I'll tell you about it, okay? Williamsburg, Williamsburg is in Virginia. Patrick Henry urges the House of Burgesses to vote for war with Britain. One of Patrick Henry's famous parts of the speech is, Give me liberty, 
which means give me freedom or give me death. That became part of the war cry for um, the thing. Lexington, Paul Revere warns the colonists of a British attack. And he goes, the redcoats are coming, the redcoats are coming. And he rode from Lexington to Concord. I've actually gone, when we were over there, um, as a Girl Scout, we went from Lexington to Concord. Um, we didn't, I think we were on in a car, not on a horse, obviously. And I don't think we walked it. Um, but that takes place all up here. So... The blue one is New York City, is where Peter Zinger's trial was. The green one is Boston. A uh, Crispus Atticus led to the Boston Massacre. Boston Harbor, which is up here in the orange, um, that's where they threw the tea off the ship. Red is Williamsburg, Virginia. That's Patrick Henry. Give me liberty, give me death. Purple is Lexington, Paul Revere, Lexington Concord, the road to self-government. That's awesome. Well, this is Lexington, not Kentucky. The road to self-government. Focus activity, read to learn. How did the colonists begin to govern themselves? Vocabulary, assembly, town meeting, militia, delegate. We still use delegates, so this is still an important word to know right now. People, Thomas Jefferson, Richard Henry Lee, John Adams, John Peter Zanger, Phyllis Wheatley, Places Williamsburg. Read aloud. In 1741, angry members of Massachusetts Assembly tried to remove Governor Jonathan Belcher from office. The King of England had appointed Belcher, but the Assembly members did not like him. The governor, in turn, complained about the members. They think, he said, that they are as big as the Parliament of Great Britain. The big picture, as you read in chapter 9, the population of the colonies had grown dramatically in the 1700s. As the colonies grew, they gained experience in governing themselves. The colonists had been creating their own governing bodies and laws since early 1600s. Some followed their own written laws, such as the Mayflower Compact. We learned about that from the Pilgrims, right? Mayflower Pilgrims Compact. Most use English laws, such as innocent until proven guilty, to govern themselves. They modeled their colonial assemblies or lawmaking bodies on Parliament. Parliament is Britain's lawmaking body. So we have Congress in Great Britain has Parliament. Okay, it's kind of similar. As you read, read in Chapter 7, the first meeting of the Virginia's Assembly of the House of Burgesses took place at the church in Jamestown in 1619. The first colonial assembly served as a model for other colonial assemblies. In this lesson, you will read about the colonists' growing desire for self-government. You will also read about how this desire led to the founding of some of the important rights we enjoy in our country today. So the stuff that they're going to do is going to be so good that it's going to last 17, 1776 is when it happened, right? 1876, 1976. So it's been about a little over 250 years since they set up laws. Can you imagine laws being good for over 250 years? That's a pretty long time, isn't it? Longer than my lifetime, that's for sure. It says... Law, colonial government. Laws affecting each colony were made up by the colonial assemblies. In the New England colonies, the town meeting was the earliest form of self-government. Remember, um, in, in New England, they had the big green space, right? Remember the big green space? 
And they also had a meeting place. And if they didn't have an actual meeting place, meeting place, they would meet in the church. And the church was their meeting place. The town meeting was a group of male colony colonists who got together to solve local problems. So if you were a girl, did you get to help solve problems? Nope. In other colonies, men created written plans for government. These plans spelled out important rights that the colonists would have. The chart on this page lists some of these plans for government in the colonies. So in 1620, they, did, they wrote the Mayflower Compact. That was a written agreement to make laws for the Plymouth Colony. In 1639, they had the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. It was a written plan for government that gave the right to vote to free men who owned property in Connecticut. So remember, we talked a lot about that, right? Free men who owned property, and we said nobody in here owns property, right? So none of the free men, which would be boys in here, you're all free, but nobody owns property, so you can't vote. Maryland Toleration Act, a law giving religious freedom to all Christians in Maryland. 1682 is the Pennsylvania Frame of Government. It's a written plan for government that granted religious freedom to colonists in Pennsylvania. So these are about religious freedoms, right? This one is voting, and this one is making the laws for Plymouth Colony. It says, as at right is uh, 1753 Mace from Norfolk, Virginia. So this is a Mace from Norfolk, Virginia. The Mace, a club-shaped staff, has been used by lawmaking bodies since the 1300s to call an assembly to order. So they're calling a group of people to order. So it'd be kind of like Miss Richardson standing up here, and I would do this kind of a thing. Right? So this mace, that pointy thing, you would tap it on the ground, and everybody would stop. It's kind of like a judge's hammer. That's a good analogy. Um, a mace is still used today in the United States House of Representatives. So if you ever have a chance to go to the House of Representatives or you could possibly watch them on TV, right, you can see them maybe calling it to order. Which plans for government granted Christian colonists freedom of religion? Which ones granted freedom of religion? Pennsylvania frame of government is one of them. There's one other one. Yep, Maryland Toleration Act. Which plan for government were written for two of New England's colonies? Connecticut. So this one was written for Connecticut. Well, which ones were New England colonies? So if we go back. Go back and we find where the New England colonies were. The New England colonies were Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, Rhode Island. So was Maryland New England? Was Maryland New England? No, so it's not Maryland. Sorry, you can't see it. Um, and we said Connecticut is Connecticut New England? Yep, Connecticut's in New England. Is Pennsylvania New England? Yeah. 
That's strange, because they said... Well, for sure, Connecticut is. Oh, Plymouth. Plymouth is where? Plymouth would be in Massachusetts, and that's New England, right? So this one, these two were New England. These two were the middle colonies, right? Royal governors. Eight of the 13 colonies were ruled by royal governor. Royal. Do we have royalty in the United States? Royal. What does royal mean? King or queen or princess? Do we have kings, queens, or princesses in the United States? We don't. So royal means it came from England, right? So a royal governor was not elected by the colonists. Instead, he was chosen by the king of England. Royal governors saw that the colony obeyed British laws. Sometimes the governor and the assembly disagreed on which laws had to be obeyed. If the governor found the assembly unwilling to support him, he could dissolve or shut down the assembly. Basically, if you don't agree with me and you don't do what I say, then I can make you not be lawmakers anymore. Does that sound fair to you? No. Assembly members could, in return, refuse to vote for money for the governor's plan. Let's keep, let's, let us keep the dogs poor and then, and we'll make them do what we please. One New Jersey assembly member said to the, said of one of the governors, the royal governors did not always have the same view as the assembly members. The Virginia House of Burgesses. In 1624, King James of Britain had made Virginia a royal colony and appointed a royal governor to rule the colony. The House of Burgesses still had some power. It could, for example, decide whether to divide large countries into smaller ones. It could also make laws about the sale of tobacco. Tobacco was a cash crop, right? You earned a lot of money from that. By the middle of the 1700s, the colonial Burgesses had gained much valuable experience in self-government. So, remember House of Burgesses, they started governing themselves a long time ago. By now, they have a lot of experience. The talented Burgesses, on a spring day in 1769, Thomas Jefferson traveled to Williamsburg, Virginia's capital. Only 26 years old, the young planter and lawyer had just been elected Burgesses. Jefferson, uh, they're the lawmaking group in Virginia. Um, Jefferson judged the House of Burgesses to be the most dignified body of men ever assembled to make laws. Most of the Burgesses were wealthy planters. George Washington and Richard Henry Lee served as Burgesses. They felt it was their duty to help govern the colony. But sometimes the assembly could try their patience. Lee, so Richard Henry Lee, who served from 1758 to 1776, admitted to his brother his disappointment about not getting much work done. I find the attendance on the assembly so expensive and the power of doing good so rarely occurring that I am determined to quit. Basically, people are not, it's a lot of money to not get a lot done. Does that make sense? Many Burgesses were also tired of the many procedures connected to government. Formal ceremonies took up 
most of Jefferson's first day uh, in office. So this is the House of Burgess, uh, members of the Virginia House of Burgesses met in this room right here in 1700s. They wore wigs while they were here. So these are the wigs or some of the wigs they wore. They covered their normal hair and their hair was made out of a, or they, with a white wig. Sometimes judges do. Most of the time it was judges back in the day that do that or did that. What? The House of Burgesses did make some important laws for the colony. The Burgesses had the power to print money. So it means they can make money. They had the power to call for taxes so they can charge you money. They had the ability to build roads so they can make the roads smooth or build new roads. And they could make land laws. They also had the power to prepare for war and raise money to support the colony's militia. A colonial militia was a military force made up of volunteers. The militia was similar to today's National Guard, which is made up of citizen soldiers. Now, National Guard today has to do training, right? They would have to go, National Guard goes away for training, um, and they get paid to be in the National Guard. Back then, it was just volunteers. Now, right now, we sir, we have a voluntary military. So that means if you want to join the military and you can pass the test, you can join the military. Sometimes in our history, we've had what's called a draft, which means you have to join the military. But right now, our military is voluntary. Um, sometimes they made wigs out of horse hair, so they cut hair off a horse and they use that. Um, sometimes they made wigs out of synthetic hairs, which means fake hair. Um, sometimes they make wigs out of real people hair. So, so what the more expensive the wig is generally the more real the wig is like it has human hair so excuse me so if you lose your hair because of cancer you can pay to buy a wig that has fake hair on it or you can pay to buy a wig that has real hair in it and um, so somebody can go to, um, my niece has donated hair before, she had really long hair, they put it in a ponytail, they cut it off above the ponytail, and then they send it in, and they use people's hair to make real looking wigs or real, real hair wigs for people. All right. Um, a model for the colonies. This is a picture of Thomas Jefferson. It was painted by the artist C.W. Peel. Richard Hen Henry Lee, right here, this is Richard Henry Lee, was also a strong supporter of the colony's rights. A model for the colonies. By 1760, Virginia's assembly was the model for the colonial government. Every colony had elected an assembly, like the House of Burgesses. To be elected a delegate or a member of the assembly had to meet several requirements. Today we have delegates. We pick people to represent us in places. And that's exactly what they're talking about. A delegate had to be an adult, white, male. In most colonies, he also had to own a certain amount of land, which we've talked about land, adult, white, and male. And follow the Protestant faith. So Protestant faith separated from the Catholic, so it's not Roman Catholic, they had to be a Protestant. Um, in, thus, in many, most colonies, women, African Americans, Catholics, 
Jews and Native Americans could not be elected. Most of the delegates were wealthy merchants. Merchants are uh, store owners, sellers at stores, or lawyers. In 1770, a lawyer named John Adams was elected to the Massachusetts Assembly. Benjamin Franklin was pleased to serve in the Pennsylvania Assembly. Franklin wrote that he was flattered. Um, that made him feel good. If you flatter somebody, make them feel good. All right, we are out of time. Let me look at... Um, this is going to be your worksheet. You are not going to be able to do it all. Um, let me highlight the ones we've done so far. Chosen by the King of England. You know who was chosen by the King of England. Um, you know, we talked about this one, delegates. We talked about this one, have the power to dissolve the colonial assemblies. Yeah, I was just trying to think. I think we might have even done the next one, but if you want to do the first four. I think you can do the first. I can think we can do these. What are the last one? The last one and seven and eight we have not covered yet. So you can do one, two, three, four, five. You can do five right now. Do you hand it in until they're all done? Any other questions before you guys get to work? Oh, another question. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.